Hello, welcome to the Dialogue with the Dean of Architecture here at Hong Kong U. My name is Dr. Eric Schuldenfrey. I'm the Head of Architecture. And joining me today is Isabel Chan, the Program Director for the Bachelors of Science and Surveying, Professor Shending He, uh, Head of the Department of Urban Planning and Design, Matthew Pryor, Head of Division of Landscape Architecture, and Professor Chris Webster, the Dean of the Faculty of Architecture. I'll pass it to you, and we'll start the, the dialogue. Thank you, Eric. For students of the built environment, there is no better location than here, where I am, no better time than now. Hong Kong is part of 11 uh, core cities in the uh, Greater Bay Area. Uh, beyond the Greater Bay Area, there are five, there is about half the world's population within five hours flying time. Uh, the Greater Bay Area is something like the world's first 100 million city. Um, the US population is 330 million. Uh, China will be adding to its built environment um, about the same scale within about a 20 year period. We're building again uh, a US in about 20 years. That requires planners, landscapes, architects, um, and many other professions to uh, engage in this major social experiment. Our planet has arrived at a poignant moment, never experienced before. Uh, some call it the singularity movement, uh, where urban and rural become fused, if you like. Uh, before the onset of the Industrial Revolution, the proportion of the global population living in cities was really minimal, almost zero actually. Over the past 250 years, the proportion has accelerated exponentially. By the first quarter of the 20th century, it was less than 15%. But the last quarter of the current century, 21st century, it will be pushing 80%, almost 100% we could say. So between now and 2050, an average rate of around 1.5 million people will be urbanized every single week, producing a city the size of Hong Kong roughly every month. Just imagine that for a moment. For 50,000 years, modern humans lived at approximately 0% urbanization, living as hunter-gatherers and then 10,000 years moving into, ago moving into the first villages. Within a short period of time, of about 300 years, that will have shifted to approximately 100% urbanization. Why does this matter? What m might it mean for your career choice? Our experience in the Faculty of Architecture, Hong Kong U, shows that those intelligent enough to study, to become a medical doctor, lawyer, financier, um, amongst those people, there are those also who could choose instead to shape the future of cities. May you be one of them. Buildings account for 36% of global energy use, produce far more carbon emissions than any other sector in the economy. Built environment contributes to climate change through all sorts of ways. The urban heat island effect, cities are much hotter at their core than the surrounding uh, countryside, sometimes by 10%. They exhaust groundwater sources that were deposited during the last ice age and never return. They pollute rivers that, s that whole countries downstream depend upon. Yet cities also create wealth and culture, provide health care, educational services that lift people out of poverty and subsistence and actually create culture. Buildings are and always have been at the very centre of human civilization. But they will need to change if the human race is to survive and continue to thrive. There's a reason why designers and makers of buildings have had a prominent position in society throughout history. From the builders of ancient pyramids in the Nile Delta to the Renaissance inspired artist architects from the 1400s, 1500s in Europe to the multi-skilled architects, engineers, planning, planners, landscape designers, construction project management personnel that currently shape our cities. Building 
city planning, city greening projects in the 21st century are much, much more complex than they have ever been. Shaping our habitats to be environmentally sustainable places, healthy, healing places, economically vibrant places, resilient places, socially safe, rich, diverse and harmonious places requires the most creative of minds. European Renaissance society was ready for the rise of the so-called Renaissance man. Sadly, there were very few Renaissance women who merged science and engineering with a new depth of art made possible by developments in the science of drawing, the physics of construction, and the application of distinctive spiritual and social vision for the first time. Hong Kong Youth Faculty of Architecture is on the trajectory to educate what we like to call um, the singularity person, if you like, fusing art and vision, deep sense of history with technology and data-driven analysis of contemporary human society, economy and built habitat. The sheer complexity of building and city planning projects, the age of mass economy, mass technology means a different kind of genius is required. Expert skills, um, geniuses uh, who can work with a fused city and countryside in jobs that we hardly know how to describe at the moment. So the future is here. It's here in Hong Kong where I sit right now with my colleagues. Um, might you have a role as a professional who shapes it? Thank you, Dean Chris Webster. Uh, for the introductory remarks. Indeed, these cities are really quite vital for how we shape the future. And as people are moving into the cities, it's really our responsibility to project a city that doesn't exist today, to understand the problems that we've had in the past and the problems we have today because of how we have to rapidly urbanize. And so this idea that it's really our responsibility to teach the future generations for them to lead for them to take the reins and actually produce a city we never imagined. And that really is what's happening in the Faculty of Architecture. We're projecting a city that doesn't yet exist. And we're not replicating cities that we've seen before. We need to create entirely new cities, entirely new ideas as well. So in order to do that, we actually have to have a lot of knowledge about real estate and construction. If we're going to construct cities that are environmentally sound, if we're going to fund the finances behind those cities, which are rather expensive today, to do the right things for sustainability, we need to figure out how we can afford that. And it's not affording it for ourselves, it's affording this for future generations as well. And so we need to work out today how we really understand the real estate side, the construction side, and also what we wish for for our future. So delighted to have Isabel Chan uh, in talking about surveying um, for the bachelor's degree. Thank you, Eric. Um, as mentioned by Professor Webster, um, the urban environment can hardly be built by just single professions. And um, you know, we have a whole batch of built environment professionals and surveyors are part of it. Um, the Department of Real Estate and Construction offered a BSc degree in surveying. So we're often being asked, what is surveying? Um, is it related to questionnaire <laughs> survey? Or um, probably from the name of our department, real estate, people may also ask, um, is it related to buying or selling, selling properties? Um, well, in fact, surveying is actually um, an integrated profession, which enables surveyors to contribute in different phases in the land development cycle. So if we take um, COVID-19's impact to our society as an example, um, uh, let's say before the pandemic, um, people stay in the built environment for like 90% of their time. But um, after the pandemic, this percentage has increased to 92 or even higher in cities which are being locked down. It means that it's even more important for us to, you know, enhance safety, uh, ensure health, reduce the possibility of spreading and infections within the built environment. And um, we actually have our building surveyors who have long been taking care of the proper functioning of buildings. And um, in this period of time, um, the public and also other parties have been relying greatly on their expert advice on how can they you know, properly assess, assess the safety of their buildings and also how can they enhance their buildings. So their advice would 
would not just be um, useful for the existing buildings, but also you know, um, um, uh, sharing the knowledge with the designers for future projects. And if we look at it from another perspective, we also have the uh, property facilities management surveyors. Um, after the pandemic, many of our hospitals are actually overloaded. So this means um, is even more important for us to ensure precise management and monitoring of the hospital assets. Um, we have colleagues who have been working on how can we apply um, innovative technologies like BIM, our building information modeling, and IoT to Internet of Things on um, um, managing in real time the environmental uh, information like the air pressure in different wards in hospital and also the geometric information um, of different facilities like baths and equipment in an integrative way. Um, this does not only ensure health of patients, but also our respected um, healthcare professionals, the doctors and nurses. Um, in addition to this, um, after the COVID-19, um, we are actually brought to the new normal, in which um, we are you know, more um, used to um, working from home practice, and also um, the, um, um, the hot desk working approach is getting more and more common these days. And it is actually the general um, practice surveyor's job to have a very strong market sense um, on all these and apply these on the new you know, development plans and also the asset management plans. In addition to that, um, let's say now if um, we decided to change an existing office building uh, into um, um, an office retail complex just because of the significantly reduced number of time that we need um, uh, to stay in office. So what we need to do is just to engage the planning surveyor to come and you know to check whether you know check the outline zoning plan and see whether any changes of land use is needed, and then on how can we do that on what expenses, and then after that we will have you know excellent architects to provide um, um, designs, and then we will have a QS quantity surveyors to based on the design of the architects to you know um, investigate the constructability the buildability of the design and also um, the cost effectiveness of the project. Project. So um, you can see how integratively we are working with each other um, to build um, the built environment. And um, in fact, it often takes just a few years or you know years for buildings to be planned, designed, and constructed. But then the buildings will be there for decades or for century. So um, it's really important for us to think about, um, in addition to just giving birth to it, um, can we nurture it? Um, how can we make sure that its life is meaningful in different phases? So in addition to just giving birth to it, because building would, just, um, would not be just you know, survive themselves. They will grow old, they may get sick at some point of time. Um, they may want a new look sometimes. They may also need a new life sometimes. So it is our job and you know, by the collaboration of all different built environment professionals in um, contributing to um, the healthiness of our cities and also you know, by ensuring the health of our buildings. Thank okay. you. Yes, it's so important. Actually, when you were talking, I was thinking about Hong Kong is the city in the world, one of the first places to ever urbanize. And so we have this wealth of data if we wish to uh, address it. And to understand the city that we have built and the city that we need to build is an urgent question as well. And obviously surveying intersects with all our different disciplines as well, as they, they all do. They're all interrelated. We all need to depend on one another's knowledge and resources as well in order to build uh, this city. So next we have uh, Professor Shen Jing here uh, so for the urban planning. Okay, thank you, Eric. So the Bachelor of Arts in Urban Studies is an interdisciplinary, studio-based and professionally oriented program offered by the uh, Department of Urban Planning and, and Design. And it's designed to equip you with the in-depth knowledge about diverse aspects of cities and urban systems, which forms a very basic and essential knowledge uh, for various urban professions. So in order to do urban studies, you need to understand the city. So first of all, I would invite you to think about the changing role of cities in humanity and also uh, the impact on our planet. About half a century ago, stu uh, people still think that cities are killing the planet, killing the earth because of uh, various urban diseases, uh, for example, congestion, pollution, overcrowdedness, and so on and so forth. But uh, in the recent three decades, 
people have changed their mind. They actually think that this can save the planet. Why? Because there was a strong belief that urban built environment can be reshaped, can be re-engineered to cope with the uh, global challenges in the environment, particularly climate change. So uh, density is actually considered having a, a profound uh, value in, uh, env in environmental uh, protection. Uh, because to reduce the impact on the environment, so people propose the idea of compact city, urban intensity, and uh, smart growth, and so on and so forth. So uh, Hong Kong is a city with uh, extreme high density, so it's a perfect place for you to examine such an idea. And of course, uh, green urbanism will be built into the built environment as well to achieve uh, those goals. Um, currently, we are um, facing the pandemic and people might want to flee to the uh, countryside, to the rural areas and are people losing faith in cities? Uh, I, would, I would say no, because if we look back uh, um, historically, we can see that not only technology advancement is um, helping the city to reshape, to rebirth uh, over generations and uh, centuries, but also a crisis like pandemic can also help cities evolve and um, rebirth into a new shapes and to achieve better results, uh, to achieve uh, better uh, well-being for human race. So if we think about back in 19th century, uh, the corona pandemic actually helped uh, urban planners, architects and different professions in the cities uh, to uh, build the city in a better way to promote health, promote uh, well-being. So I would say that we are now in, uh, facing a great opportunity to really rethink uh, how do we, uh, as a, a, a group, a collectively urban profession, can contribute to better city, to save the planet. So I hope that uh, the future generation can uh, hold the same passion as us uh, to join us uh, in this uh, BAUS program. So in this program, we actually can uh, educate you different skills that to uh, cope with uh, the social, economic, environmental, political, all sorts of problems that face uh, by our cities. And uh, in this curriculum, we will uh, prepare, uh, we will design the courses in a problem-based um, uh, approach. First of all, you are faced by different problems that uh, our cities are, are facing, and then you uh, provide a critical pr appraisal on the existing intervention. And, and then you are encouraged to propose your own alternative or even better solution through either policy uh, intervention, uh, through urban design thinking approaches, or through uh, urban management regulation, and so on and so forth, to come up with the best solution for your own city, uh, for our Hong Kong. Okay, so uh, I would uh, end with that. And again, welcome to our BAUS program. Thank you very much. As you were speaking, I was actually thinking of a doctor uh, who was looking at a map made by surveyor, uh, who was <laughs> thinking about how disease spreads. And at the time, it was the 1800s, it wasn't known about how the diseases spread. And through the map and through understanding uh, of the, uh, where disease was happening within the city, uh, there was a idea about how the disease possibly could have spread. And where it links into urban planning is I secretly think the doctor was thinking like an urban planner rather than thinking like a doctor. Because it's actually that impact that the doctor had on how we build our cities. It's that impact that the doctor had on how we rethink these urban areas. Should an urban area be something that uh, might be seen as contributing to actually something that starts to kill us? because we perceive that as we bring lots of people together, disease at that time was seen as to spread through that population rapidly. The rural areas were indeed safe, safer. Uh, that has completely switched because of the work that has been done in your area for hundreds of years now. Exactly. That now every successive generation uh, is responding really thinking about it from a surveying point of view to know where the disease is, uh, to an urban planning point of view to prevent that spread, uh, to architecture and landscape point of view to also how it better integrates uh, within the city as well. So next we have Matthew Pryor uh, to introduce landscape. The, the, these are really interesting subjects and just thinking after listening to, to, to your um, analogy, uh, Eric, 
Hong Kong, at the end of the 19th century, Hong Kong was known as a plague city because it had not been planned. It didn't have the uh, services and the, the, the sanitation, the drainage, the fresh air, the building controls. Now, 100 years later, it's a world leader, particularly in the areas of public health and urban design, urban planning. We've learned from the past. We've learned from these mistakes. And Hong Kong has always been a really interesting laboratory for testing out ideas because of its high density, high rise um, morphology. You know, it has very, very critical problems. But these are problems that we learn from, we find solutions to, and then we export those to the rest of the world. We share our knowledge. So Hong Kong, Hong Kong U is right at the center of that laboratory and a really good place to study all of the different disciplines within the built environment. Landscape architecture is just a, a component of that, but we're delighted to be within this family because much of the, many of the issues that we're dealing with in landscape echo and uh, are matched with and over intersect with issues dealt with by urban planning and design, um, surveying architecture, uh, and uh, interdisciplinary design is a core to all of our programs. The issues are current, they're immediate, they're very urgent, and we need to find solutions very quickly to them. We not, need not only to identify the problem, but we also need to work out how to solve those problems. And we very, very much need good minds, we need some very energetic people to come in and help us, help each of the, um, each of the disciplines um, to develop new ideas and new approaches to the way that we plan and design and construct and manage our cities uh, in order to try and help solve some of the, these really difficult problems. You know, we all know about climate change, um, but as a landscape architect, I, I was recently um, invited into a research team looking at microplastics in Hong Kong. It never occurred to me that microplastics was a problem in Hong Kong, but apparently it's a huge problem on our roads uh, generated through car tires. Every, every year, every month, we seem to be finding a new challenge. And so we need to be very flexible, very adaptable. Uh, and we really need to be going after these problems and really finding uh, good solutions. Landscape architecture has a tradition in uh, estates management and parks and gardens. But nowadays, we teach landscape architecture through these issues, the skills and the, the knowledge that we need. And we develop those through the, the first uh, two years of the, the BALS program. These are very common and have a lot in common with uh, the architecture and surveying and planning. We take these on in third and fourth years in the BLS program to look at some of the chronic issues, whether it's the urban poor, whether it's uh, pollution of our watercourses, whether it's the sinking coastline in, in Indonesia, whether it's the impact of uh, soil loss in, in the west of China. Many, many critical issues that we need to get engaged with. And so we've constructed the program, another studio-based program with problem-based learning, but we've constructed that around addressing these problems and learning the skills and developing our skills and knowledge in an attempt to address those problems. And of course, landscape sits right next to all of these other disciplines. And we know that the future is about putting these disciplines together. So across the entire faculty, we have a very strong interdisciplinary aspect to what we teach and the way that we teach and putting students together, putting minds together so that, that together they can uh, help us create some of the solutions that we need to um, these problems. I, I was interested in, in the Dean's uh, speech, uh, the, the comments you made, Chris, about the, you know, the, the future of the city the fact that we're all going to end up in a city. This, this is, a, is, in some ways, a really scary thing. In some ways, it's, maybe it's a blessing in disguise. You know, within landscape, we, we think not only about the urban landscape, but also the natural landscape and how these are blended together. How do we protect and conserve? How do we develop new landscapes that might help us uh, find a better balance between community and environment? And I was also sort of thinking about community the fact that the city isn't just a, a physical structure, it's actually a set of people who live in that structure. And we work very much with community, and I think we all have courses in community and environment. And how do we engage communities? How do we find a better balance between them and their, their living environment? So these are very much the issues that 
all of us are addressing in our different ways. We all need different skills, but we all need to put those skills together. And I think architecture, more than, more than any, is, is at the center of this. I'm also thinking about the eco ecological issue, um, oh. because many of your colleagues also look at our urban ecologies, yes, and, and actually really how do we have more biodiversity mm. within our cities, mm. um, and what impact that has on us. Thinking, I was actually just uh, uh, sending some messages with, with Bin this morning. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And Bin is one of our colleagues who, who studies in his urban lab. Uh, he mm. studies the psychological aspects of greenery. Yes. And in the studies, um, there's this high uh, correlation between how green landscapes reduce our stress levels, reduce anxiety, and we also know that if you're less stressed, less anxious, you'll live a happier, better life. And so landscape and the urban aren't in um, conflict with an, one another potentially. It's how we start to integrate landscape with the urban as well. And so with tens of thousands of years of human mm. uh, living, often as we now know, in these environments that were actually quite rural, and we move into cities, our minds are still very much connected with the uh, rural, with the greenery and the lifestyle that that had. As we move into cities, if we want to reduce our stress levels, we want to mm. live happier, better lives, I think we need to integrate more tightly these ideas about how the landscape comes into our cities and form a dialogue with our cities. Exactly, and it's really fascinating that the research behind the sort of landscape perception and stress goes back in thousands of years into history about the sort of the, the hunter-gatherer situation, uh, you know, prospect refuge theory. But it's only recently that we've started to think about how do we design the city to make us healthier? You know, how do, how do we create a, an environment, create a a pattern of uh, behavior in the city that, you know, it's not just a question of this isn't as bad as it, you know, it could be. It's how does this actually make us better? And that's why we're engaging in, in sort of rooftop farms and agriculture and, and greenways and the ecology of the city and understanding our position within that ecology. Th these are really exciting topics. So evidence of mm -hmm. that is that cities in China in the last 20 years have become that much more green than oh, yes, the yes, cities yes. before. Uh, another researcher in the faculty uh, just finished creating a, um, an international global green index, uh, Bin Chen, mm -hmm. um, uh, and it shows that uh, cities are becoming greener. So if you put together the idea that cities are becoming greener, more pleasant, more natural for us humans who grew up as hunter-gatherers and evolved uh, with green uh, so that we're physiologically deprived when we're without green. Um, put that together with the, the wealth-creating drive that has always led people to cluster together in cities, then I, I predict uh, cities will become larger and we will move to, to if not one big cluster, um, but, you know, will everybody, <laughs> will everybody in France eventually end up in Paris? Uh, no, quite clearly not. But will they end up in a few clustered big cities? Mm -hmm. The evidence points that that's, to that being the case. Nigeria, biggest mm -hmm. city in, uh, biggest country and economy in Africa. Lagos, biggest city mm -hmm. in Nigeria. Uh, by 2050, 60, uh, Lagos will probably be about 60, 70 million people. Um, and there'll be four or five other uh, cities of that size in Africa. It, there's an irony. Uh, students, you know, our students who would love you to join us and study these things together. Uh, in some ways, it's up to us. It's up to our analysis. It's up to our guidance. Will this trend continue? Uh, or will there be a societal rebellion to spread us out again, the great cluster or the great decentralization, which is it to be? I realize I come from a very rural area and then moving to Hong Kong, I realized that when I was in a very rural area, I relied wholeheartedly on the library of books. So the books were my interaction with the world, with the, inter <laughs> the interaction with thought. But since moving to Hong Kong, it's more dialogues like this, that that's where I gain my knowledge from. It's understanding the knowledge from the different fields and then how it impacts my own 
field of architecture mm -hmm. and design as well. And so for, for architecture, uh, I'll just briefly introduce architecture mm -hmm. as well. Uh, so for architecture, I was just the judge of a Green Building Award. So this is a sustainability award. And the purpose of the award is to award uh, the best sustainable buildings. Those who aren't just creating a very uh, ecological and sound building that has the less uh, impact for the world. But these are the buildings that are really the hallmark, the leaders in the world. But what struck me so much is that each of the people presenting to win the award, there was a competition, um, each of the people were fi fixated on spending half their time talking about the greenness of the building, the sustainability, mm -hmm. the future of this. And then the other half was spent on livability. Mm -hmm. And although we weren't judging livability, we were judging the sustainable aspects of the building, you could see that they're connected. Mm -hmm. How we can live in our cities today is deeply connected about the type of buildings and cities and urban areas that we create. And at the heart of it was also financing it all. Because if we can't only afford expensive buildings um, that are make up of a lot of Hong Kong, how do we bring this to the entire population? Mm -hmm. How do we experiment, and it takes money to experiment, but then how do we then take that high level expensive building mm -hmm. and bring it to make it the common building so that we all enjoy greater mm -hmm. livability? And many of these issues were about how we interact with one another. Mm -hmm. And this is where creativity becomes so critical because we can have the data in front of us, but in order to really interpret that data, we need the creative mind. We also need a way of informing one another. So the way that we teach architecture is in studio. We all gather together. Each of the students then really has their own idea for design. Then they discuss it among each other to see how robust that idea is. And then they discuss it and bring it into reviews. And it's these reviews and these dialogues that are so critical for having new ideas. It's where you test your idea. It's where you hear feedback to improve the idea as well. And so how we actually work together is really critical. And the Bachelors of Arts and Sciences in Architecture is really the degree. It's a first degree for architects. So if you want to become an architect, um, then that's really the degree that starts to lead you there. And we really seek every type of mind. I think often we think about architecture, we either, in some people who might be very good at the sciences and the mathematics, might think of architecture through the science and mathematics. Someone who's very artistic might think of architecture actually as an artistic mm -hmm. pursuit. And what actually sometimes happens is those who are very good at the mathematics and science might not want to enter architecture because they fear that actually it's always being interpreted through the arts. And those in the arts might not want to enter because they're always fearful of the math and the science. But we're after diversity. And I think it's only through diversity of thinking, of coming together and having this dialogue, that you actually have and project a, a stronger architecture overall. So everyone, in a sense, is welcome. Every type of mind is really welcome and really can participate within solving uh, problems that we identify. And it, more importantly, identifying problems that we don't even see as well. So architecture really is this intersection, I think, between many of the different disciplines that we're talking about today as well. At the same time, I want to also introduce a new program that we started. And, and it's called the Bachelors of Arts and Science and Design Plus. So we realized that we were looking at various scales. We were looking at the scale of landscape, which is, can be massive, can be the size of a country. Looking at scale of urban areas uh, as well. We were looking at the scale of architecture and how that interrelates with construction and, and, and finance as well. And then we were thinking, if we really want to have an impact on our future, we also have to think about how this intersects with design. So design, in this case, doesn't mean the design of a, of, of a glass. It doesn't mean the design of a table or a chair. Design, in this sense, is actually about creative thinking, about critical thinking. And really, how, at this point, is really bringing people together to answer and identify unsolved or unknown questions. And in this case, we set up Design Plus as a new way of thinking. So Design Plus is essentially one degree, but you'll take half your credits in an area that relates to design, uh, often answering and looking at ecological issues, sustainable 
issues uh, for future generations, or social questions, or cultural questions. And that brings uh, all the cohort together to look at those questions together. And then everyone has other uh, half of their credits in other disciplines. Mm -hmm. So be it uh, looking at the, a major in law, or a major in uh, sciences, and say chemistry or physics, uh, or engineering, mm -hmm. or history, uh, or journalism. And because they have a common um, boundary, uh, which is the design side, and then they're taking half their credits um, within other fields that they really enjoy, uh, they can bring that knowledge to the greater, uh, greater cluster. So it's really thinking about how these things interrelate. So later today, uh, we have many different opportunities to hear more about these programs as well, uh, to hear a little bit more in depth both today and then next Saturday, uh, we also have in-person conversations. So I was thinking today, maybe we have a just more open discussion mm -hmm. on some of these points raised uh, so that we can also look at the broader questions we're asking uh, for the future cities. And then if you want to know more, just please come this afternoon uh, to the individual different uh, program discussions and then come in person next week. Uh, where you can really interact with students, we can see uh, how we teach and the uh, means, the, especially the robotics and facilities and all the other things that we offer as a university as well. But maybe to start with, I have a question on health uh, because it's on everyone's mind. And I know that you often study in your own research, really how do we project forward a healthy city of the future? Where have we come from? Where are we perhaps going with this as well? It's a very open-ended question. Oh, I was, I was going to say, what's, what <laughs> health, what's the question? Um, city, well, uh, you made a point earlier, Eric. Cities used to be the unhealthy living place in the planet, and rural areas were more healthy. That tipped uh, sometime late 19th century, and certainly by the time antibiotics were discovered, um, so cities now are places of health. Hong Kong itself has the greatest longevity in the world, has done for about four or five uh, years now, top of the table. Uh, health is in many ways about design, it's about green, it's about proximity to health services. So this is an urban planning issue again. One, one hypothesis, uh, in answering the question, why, is, why does Hong Kong have the greatest longevity um, in the world, is that if you have a heart attack, uh, y you, get, y you don't stay on your own for too long. Somebody finds you very quickly, and then if you're found, uh, it doesn't take long to get to an emergency uh, unit. It's since been discovered that that is not <laughs> the answer oh. to <laughs> the question. But it's for sure it contributes. Mm -hmm as does the green surroundings. 40% of Hong Kong is green. So there are, uh, I've published many papers on what parts of the built environment contribute to health of different types, all sorts of things. Living density does. We just published a paper with a medical school um, to show that the size of your living space, not the net density that we tend to, uh, the mm -hmm. gross density that we tend to talk about in planning, um, building mass in architecture, urban design, but your living space, we're in a tiny room here, don't know whether you can see, um, there is a direct correlation mm. between uh, blood pressure, high blood pressure, and the size of your living space. Uh, now, governments around the world will listen to that sort of science um, in determining the sort of density policies that urban planners work with and that drive design of indiv individual buildings. But this is the sort of knowledge that comes out of the, the Hong Kong condition. Uh, you know, the, the fact that we, we, we have very good health, uh, physical health metrics, but we also have challenging mental health metrics. Um, but it's only through uh, studying at universities like Hong Kong U that, that we develop this knowledge, develop this uh, uh, understanding of these conditions and then be able to find solutions to them. To design for them. I, as mm. you were speaking, I was thinking about also one of the longitudinal studies that was done would suggest mm. that if you age in place, uh, 
yeah. you also uh, will live longer. And those <laughs> who then move outside of their uh, location. So I came from the extreme north of US and it's very snowy and icy and very dangerous condition if you're old. But I know if I uh, was from there and I then chose to move to a warm, sunny climate, uh, but I cut my social ties, mm -hmm. then I will actually statistically uh, die sooner by a, quite a large margin mm -hmm. as well. So it's important to be able to have that social network. And I think that's actually something that we should question within our cities today. That if we look at how our city fabric is built, and how we have a lot of podiums and, and mm -hmm. towers, does that allow for the social interaction that we need? Does that mm -hmm. have that connectivity that we've always had as a society? Or is this something we question? Is this something we design around, we design for? And I think questions like this about how do we bring in the green spaces into our buildings, not just into the country parks, because country parks are kind of far away. It's actually inconvenient. Well, in Hong Kong, they're quite close. They're quite close. <laughs> but compared to other, but they're, yeah. for, for someone who lives, say, in Kowloon, they're, yes. they're quite uh, distant and more difficult to get to in 10 minutes or 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. Should we bring greenery back in? Should we have uh, and redesign our buildings for allowing for greater sociability? Where should that enter policy? Uh, yes. Where should that enter and be at the forefront of our minds as well? Yeah, that highlights the social aspect of uh, urban studies, mm. that we not only pay attention to the physical built environment, we also use different uh, approaches to create an environment that encourages people to interact, to create uh, um, places and also the space, not only physically but also virtually, for people to enhance their sociability so as to uh, boost up the health condition as well as uh, um, well-being in a broader sense. I'm, I'm very interested in the, the, the interest in intergenerational studies now. How do you put old people and young people together in a high-density city? You know, wh where do they meet? Uh, you know, is it in the house? Is it, uh, you know, up on the roof? Where, how, do you, how do you construct these social f networks and frameworks uh, for the community? We, we had a wonderful studio project a few years ago, colleague David Erdman, oh, yes. um, who redesigned some of the uh, housing estates in Hong mm -hmm. Kong doing exactly that, uh, putting young people apartments on the top, mm -hmm. extending the housing blocks up into intergenerational and mixed income mm -hmm. groups. That's the sort of wonderful thing you can explore in architecture, creative studios, and the links with you know, the in-depth social and economic investigations mm -hmm. that you'll learn to do if you study urban planning um, have a wonderful creative interaction with these sorts of design issues. But to know the questions that we're asking, oftentimes we also have to collect the data in the first place. So I think actually how the uh, Internet of Things, IoT, is really transforming our cities to collect data, better understand how we are living currently, how we might wish to live in the future. I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit more about some of the technology. It doesn't have to be IoT, and <laughs> if you, uh, but, but some of the technology, some of the ways of looking at the city differently than we have been able to look in the past. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, in fact, it, I mean, these innovative technology has changed the way that we deliver projects and we build. Like in the past projects, most of them were delivered in linear ways. You know, our planners come in and then architects and then, you know, the construction professionals and then they found problems during the construction phase or sometimes even after the post-occupancy stage and then they go back and sometimes they cannot. <laughs> so uh, you can see that there are, you know, tons of reworks and waste of time and resources in the process. But with all these technologies like, um, like building information modeling, for example, uh, sometimes connected with uh, IoT, uh, we can actually anticipate the problems that um, different groups of professionals may encounter um, in, you know, coming phases of a project. And that's how we actually um, share or actually break the boundaries between the professional knowledge which used to resign within uh, individual professionals. And this actually helps significantly enhance the efficiency and effectiveness of the projects. And then extending that to the whole city scale, um, w when we were planning for cities, which land uses should go here? Should the city develop in this direction or that direction? Mm. We used to rely on 
10 year census or occasional big, very expensive surveys, land use transportation surveys. Uh, we can now look at um, social media generated, uh, cell phone generated yeah, data, data to track mm -hmm. diurnal changes, night times, uh, daytime changes. Where do people actually go in the city and what do they do? So we can tell real time uh, whether this works or that works uh, via sentiment analysis on Twitter. Does this type of urban design tend to make people, people feel more happy than that sort of urban design? Uh, ditto with parks. Should you build, put all the green space in the city in one central park, like in New York? We uh, have many other spaces in New York. I, I'm from New York I as don't well. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, or we have to defend New York. We have a whole you, ring. Or should you put all of the green space in the city around the edge, like the Green Belt in London? Or should you dot it through the cities? Uh, Actually, no, we didn't know when we trained. Now we can real time measure sentiment, Twitter sentiment, for example, and find out which green space distribution system works better for happiness, ditto for health. Th this raises another uh, question, because when you, when you became the dean, um, one of the first things that you did was to organize the Faculty of Architecture into Hong Kong urban labs. And the idea is that, of course, we're teaching, but we're also asking questions as well. And these labs have been growing every year. And so we're able to bring our students in who graduate as well to work in the labs, to answer and look at these questions as well. And I think it's a really important idea that we're not teaching known uh, information. Of course we are. We have a lot of knowledge. We've got gathered through hundreds of years of architecture, surveying, and, and planning. But we're also beyond looking at our disciplines from a known perspective, we're actually charting the unknown as well. And I think that the urban labs as a, as a concept is really uh, pioneering in this regard. Uh, well, we have one minute to wrap up, I think. So I'll, <laughs> I'll answer that and wrap up. The, <laughs> yes, students um, across all of our undergraduate degrees and postgraduate degrees uh, will interact with the research that's going on in, a, in the urban labs and just about any of the big topics that we've covered, we've, we've ranged high and low, broad and narrow, uh, you will encounter real researchers working with real industry partners, real professions, uh, trying to tackle and address these and some, during your studies with us you, you will get a chance to work with professionals and work with our researchers, professional researchers, and help shape the future even as you are a student. So we have time for questions from the audience. So I urge everyone to, to write in your questions uh, as well. And we do have a question from one of the members of the audience. And so the question is, are we to develop our main cities uh, and its outskirts as well? And I think because you had opened with the idea of the 100 million city, the first one in the world uh, potentially within this region, are there still outskirts today? <laughs> do we have an outskirts to our cities? Or are oh, all our cities yeah, conjoining yes. together? And what would this mean? That's, that that is a, whoever sent that in, well done. That's a, that's a really good question. Um, so the, actually the official population of the Greater Bay Area is something like 60 to 70 million. Unofficially it's pushing 80, 90. Um, but it is 11 separate cities and there are green areas in between and blue areas too. The real question is, um, does it operate as one connected labor market? is how the planners would, set, would see it. Um, connected, livable cluster of cities. Uh, and the answer, I think, it, for well-planned, for, for countries that have professions, such as the ones we're talking about, who have sufficient capacity in purchase to affect things, and that's not just the developed rich countries. Uh, you find well-planned, well-managed countries right through the income spectrum. The answer is cities will not merge into one grey blob. Um, and, but they will functionally, um, I predict, and the research shows and history shows, they'll become larger and larger functionally collected places to be sociable. 
uh, to live, to work, to recreate. Uh, so actually, although London is 10 million as a city, and you get to the edge of the city, and then you have a countryside, it's very clear, and then you have satellite cities. London actually, and the southeast of England, is probably about 22 million, one big functional city. People commute in and commute across and things. I guess uh, it also depends on how do you define cities and outskirts. <laughs> if you zoom out, actually in Asia, we have this so-called East Asian Urban Corridor, extended from Tokyo through Seoul to Beijing and also North uh, East China that is uh, closely mm -hmm. connected. So with this improved connectivity, I'm sure that uh, cities can work together in a much better way, in a more coordinated and sustainable way. Yeah. But these are really interesting questions, the sort of question we want to study here, you know, does the city have an edge? You know, in Hong Kong, we actually have fairly sharp boundaries, but in, I think in London, I grew up in suburban South London, I, you know, it goes on the, the periphery, the urban periphery goes on for miles and miles and miles, you know, a sort of blending of the countryside and the, and the, the built form. But I, I, think it, I think it's a really important question that we, 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 we look at that. When, and, from an ecological point of view, most of the interesting things come at the edge rather than at the, the middle. Edge, that's right. The, I mean, there's a, there's a technical answer to that, which comes mm. from land economics, which is taught in mm. this department and a bit in this department. The, uh, there, there is an urban a natural market urban boundary. And if you, if you come and you take my course in the first year, <laughs> uh, you'll hear me teach about it. It's, it's essentially where the, uh, the land value bid by developers, mm. the urban developers, crosses the land value um, under agricultural uses. And uh, in Shanghai, this probably happens about 60, 100 mm. kilometers outside. But um, actually, you won't see a change because in Shanghai, uh, the land market is controlled by the national constitution. Mm. And what should be urban edge mm. in Shanghai is agriculture. Uh, sometimes, yes, it's cities pop up. You know. I could see another question. Uh, I believe the question is, some consider programs in the Faculty of Architecture rather demanding. Would one still be able to minor in other subjects? So maybe I'll tackle that question. I see it as two parts. First, the demanding part. So demanding is an unusual uh, way of framing studies. Because there's two parts of demanding. One part is the very demanding professors who want the most out of the, the students and the knowledge. But the other part of demanding is a student's own innate drive for their study. And they're demanding on themselves because they care so deeply about the subject that they're studying. So I would characterize faculty of architecture not as demanding on how we seek to teach, uh, but demanding in terms of what the student seeks to learn. Mm -hmm. And it really is that self-passion for the subject matter that we see. We never tell our students, stay up all night, spend all your weekends working. But those who really love what they do, it doesn't seem like it's work. It seems like it's part of your contribution to society at large. So the other part of the question would be, would you be able to minor in other subjects? So for Design Plus, it's organized this way. You can have half your credits in design, and then you take a minor or major in another subject, even sometimes two minors in two different subjects as well. And we're also introducing uh, and allowing for uh, those to take a minor in architecture. And this is something that we've actually switched and are switching this year, and also a major. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is still uh, a possibility. But at the moment, because of accreditation for architecture, we have a lot of uh, need for the full amount of time when a student is here. Accreditation by the professional but, Sorry, yeah. yes, thank you. <laughs> um, but we still do have uh, courses cross-cutting through mm -hmm. the first year studies at Hong Kong U, the Common Core. Um, mm -hmm. that allows for this exploration, uh, open exploration of, of, of questions as well. Well, in, in landscape, we just set up a minor. So we, we've just had our first set of students taking minors in other subjects. So I've got a student studying landscape and Japanese. That's their interest. That's, you know, that, that's leading them in a particular direction. And I think for their future careers, that's going to be a really distinguishing feature on their CV. Yes. Um, so we, we're very keen to allow students to, to do that. 
Well, for BAUS, we don't really have a lot of complaint from our students <laughs> demanding. So. <laughs> 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 Yeah. For BSc surveying, because um, um, we're also professionally accredited by uh, four local and international um, professional bodies. And for Hong Kong IS, we've got um, um, a recognition from five divisions. Um, that's why our program is quite um, you know, well-structured and does not really allow you know, a formal major. However, in the past uh, years, there are highly capable students who have sought for um, um, approval for taking minor in finance or in mm -hmm. law, and we actually approve that on case-by-case -case basis. We also we have students coming into the faculty uh, mm -hmm. who have an interest in architecture who mm -hmm. might take a history course or a studio or other. Yeah. And that's really uh, the student expressing from other faculty across Hong Kong U uh, interest in architecture, and we, we welcome that as well. So there's another question. As a uh, student who's interested in architecture, uh, what learning experience should I equip myself with? I think I'd have to answer a natural sense of curiosity. Mm -hmm. uh, that wherever you think that you uh, wish to look is actually a really fundamental part of how it intersects with architecture. And as you can see from the conversation today, architecture, and actually architects I think are famously um, of the mind that they do everything. And we sometimes we have to temper that expectation a little bit as well. But it's really, I think, really driving that sense of natural curiosity. And if you are very interested in mathematics or very interested in biology and chemistry and the sciences, there's a place within the Faculty of Architecture to bring that knowledge in as well. But I also think this idea of how history plays out. Uh, we've been reflecting a lot today about the past. And in order to project for that future, we also be, need to be very knowledgeable about where we've come. What are those problems that we might have inadvertently created for ourselves that didn't exist 100 years ago that we need to address today? And I think it's actually that understanding of the past, how it intertwines with the future. And of course, there's a lot more in terms of technology and other aspects. We're using a lot more robotics and other 3D printing. It's very technological. So if you have access to that uh, technology, that would also be uh, very useful to investigate. I, I used to say to incoming landscape students the, the, the key interests were in environment, community, and design. But then I realized that probably applied to all of our programs. <laughs> yeah. but if, all of us are uh, interested in students who, who want to learn things about this. In, in terms of what, what experience should you equip yourself with, uh, read a lot, observe a lot, look at projects, uh, try and uh, question why things are the way they are. Um, in landscape, one of our key skills that we're teaching is observation. Can we have a look at a landscape and can we understand it at different levels? So I would think that uh, you could equip yourself very well by just observing, just looking at projects, looking at case studies, reading histories. Um, Maybe a last point because we're mm -hmm. wrapping up. The, one of my favorite um, qualities of our under, undergraduate programs in the faculty it is our field work, our field trips. And uh, when I first came, I found that our landscape students were, had just come back from South America. My first question was, how do they afford that, to, to take 20 or 30 students off to South America? <coughs> um, I'm not going to answer that question. A very generous <laughs> donor, actually, <laughs> often is that the hard to answer. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so our, our architecture students are off to, they're building rural, houses in the middle of mainland China. Uh, landscape, Ma Matthew takes students to the borders of Cambodia and Thailand and, and China to, for some experiential learning projects. Um, and our urban design students been to Poland. Goes and, uh, to Paris, Paris. India. Yeah. So you really... And we also went to India and okay. some you, other... You really sizes. cannot underestimate mm. the power of observation. Mm. Uh, we equip you with theoretical issues, a different pair of lenses, different pair of mm. uh, glasses, uh, eyeglasses, to look at the world and then take you out and you observe. And you come back from Paris, Mongolia, Bolivia, uh, Jakarta, uh, with more mature, with mm. new knowledge. 
So I'd like to take the opportunity to thank all our speakers. Uh, thank you very much for contributing to today's dialogue with the Dean. And I want to also express uh, thanks for everyone who joined us uh, online today. So we have program talks throughout the day. Uh, so we have at 12.30, the Bachelors of Science in Surveying. At 2 o'clock, we have Urban uh, Studies. And at 4 o'clock, we have, in combining together, Architecture Landscape mm -hmm. um, and also Design Plus. And then next week, we have on-campus events. Uh, so we're welcoming you to Hong Kong U, uh, where we have a wide diversity of events uh, for you on November 6th. So thank you very much for joining us today and hope to see you uh, later this afternoon and next week.